Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, let's see, what is it, 23rd, 22nd day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Uh, tomorrow is Thanksgiving, which in some ways, Thanksgiving, I think, is like Mother's Day and Father's Day for me. It is, well, it's an excuse for a family, but really, th these are things, you know, honor your father and mother is not a one day a year thing. Uh, nor is being thankful to God. That should be a 24-hour day thing. Although, we can thank him in our sleep. Yes. Uh, <laughs> our spirits don't sleep anyway, I don't think. Who knows? Who knows? We're, we're, not, uh, given, uh, we're not given an awful lot of information about the spiritual world, in fact. And we live in a physical world. Yet we're spirits in physical bodies. All right, so uh, what I want to talk about is one of the problems with Christianity in America, and it's not just America, but this has been a this problem goes back uh, way back to say the Second Great Great Awakening in in uh, specifically. The Second Great Awakening was not a evangelical re um, revival at all. It was something else. It was not a gospel revival. And the First Great Awakening was the, the preaching of you must be born again, personal conversion, personal regeneration. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was, it showed up in all kinds of places, not just in America, not just with Wesley and Whitfield, but, uh, for example, in what I never knew about until I was born again and I happened to run across it uh, among Lutherans, that Lutheranism in the United States was very evangelical, very evangelical. Uh, Lutheranism had become very rapidly became very scholastic, unlike Luther. Uh, Luther was not a scholastic. He despised scholastics. Uh, Luther would have got along just great on Twitter. I can, with his memes and his his snarkiness and his passive aggressive responses. Yeah, with his cartoons of the Pope as a jackass with gas coming out of both ends, talking about how the Pope speaks. Those kind of things. I mean, there was it was Luther. Did not restrain himself, especially in print media. But he could be very passive aggressive too. I mean, and uh, would play the part, you know, giving honor. Like his book with Erasmus. What was the name of that book anyway? Uh, like I could find it in a stack back here someplace. But uh, the bondage of the will, the bondage of the will, uh, where you just, just like. Oh, man, he would have been hard to get along with. <laughs> we would have been going back and forth on Twitter all the time. He would have banned me right away, either that, like somebody else has done. Uh, although currently I'm not banned because it's not the same account. I don't know. Some people just don't want to be questioned. And if you don't bow down to their wisdom and their biblical, their weak, insufficient biblical case, they just ban you. What, what was I doing? Oh, it's James White with, uh, was it tattoos? Yeah, it was tattoos, I think. And I was trying to point out to him that your body is not your own. It's supposed to, you're supposed to honor God with your bo uh, body. And, and he, would, he would throw out a verse and say, well, that's not what that means. Look at the New Testament. It says this and this and this. Uh, James White doesn't like to leave one context. He says, well, he doesn't like that because he can't win a debate if the opponent won't stay within his designated boundary. We're going to walk through this text, like Rome, or John chapter 6, and you can't go outside of the boundary. <laughs> yeah, that's called rigging the debate. So it's now, when you look at Scripture, you look at all the Scripture teaches, uh, if you just if somebody's trying to get you to look at just one verse or a couple verses and they're making the big deal out of that, and you know it says other things in other places, they're trying to swindle you or bamboozle you or deceive you or something. 
uh, because that's not, a, you know, a debater, uh, the purpose of debate is just not finding the truth. It is a sporting contest. It's like a boxing match or a wrestling match. Hey, there is an idea. How about evangelical, this is satire, but somebody, somebody's probably already done this. How about this? Women's mud wrestling for Jesus. How many views do you think that would get on YouTube and, and other social media? Yeah. <laughs> Women mud wrestling for Jesus. It's probably been done. Should you do that? No. Why? Because it has nothing to do with Jesus and the gospel. And when you mix things together that shouldn't be mixed, which was the whole problem with Constantinian Christianity, the Constantinian confusion. Mixing church and state, mixing the world with the kingdom of God, mixing pol politics with Jesus Christ. It does not work. But back to the uh, Lutheranism, uh, because it got very dead and scholastic, it was all about uh, doctrinal precision, but no spiritual life. So there was a man, there was several men, but one of them, was, I think one was named Arndt and the other was named Spenner. Now, I mentioned that before, and I, when I listened to the video, I had said something else, but Spenner, it was a name like that. Uh, I think it was Jacob Spenner, not certain. I have the book someplace, and it's a very rare book now, but I bought it at the uh, ELCA bookstore at their headquarters near Chicago by the airport there. I was, uh, I got, that was back when I was, went back to that for a while to try to bring the gospel there. <laughs> dead in trespasses in a sense, dead denomination by that time. Uh, again, I, I had, there was no ELCA when I was raised. It was uh, mostly among the ALC, although I suspect we might have been, one church it might have been mm, Wisconsin Synod or Missouri uh, synod because I remember my parents were sort of complaining about things once in a while. <laughs> ALC was, I'd say moderate, but they were shifting in a decidedly bad direction. Uh, my mother, who was more um, spiritual than my father, uh, had mentioned things like that once in a while. She talked about that once in a while with me. My father didn't really discuss that. He went to, he brought us to church every Sunday. He was a good Lutheran man or husband and father, but <laughs> there were certain things that weren't talked about. I remember one time he said, you're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. I said, what else is worth talking about? <laughs> I think you can leave the politics out. But what if you're not going to talk about religion, what's life worth? I mean, it's it's like, what? What's to talk about then? But I'd been born again, so that was my life, and still is. Thank God for that. <sighs> but anyway, the, there was so there was a revival, and one man was named Spenner, and it was a evangelical revival. It was uh, it's sometimes called pietism in a derogatory sense, because the people that are Lutherans nowadays, uh, they're, they're the, uh, the ones that rejected the evangelicalism. But this is a warning, too. So it's a, it, bringing back personal devotion and a living life for the people in the pew, rather than just listening to dead theology and uh, creedal precision. It was just utterly dead. It's like listening to some of the people today. You know, they're they're just dead theologians. They're, there's no life there. It's like listening to debates about uh, textual criticism. It's, there's no gospel there at all. Uh, and it's debating whether it should be this letter or that letter. Or it's like, really? Does, does it affect the message? <laughs> Why are you debating it? It doesn't affect the message at all. But they just like to debate things like that. They, they want to focus on something other than Christ because they don't want to look at Christ because they hate him. So they'll look at other things. They'll focus on other things than Christ himself because he makes them very uncomfortable. Just like the Pharisees, tithing the dill and the mint and the cumin of the garden, but ignoring the commandments to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. 
Hmm. Yeah, we have lots of people like that in the world. Whole denominations of people that are spiritually dead, all kinds of denominations. Some of them very r rationalistic, spiritually dead, like Churches of Christ. I mean, I've run some, across some of those that were, well, <clears throat> if you held a funeral, there would there'd be an improvement. Other <laughs> um, people talking about, uh, well, heretics. As in there, like they were good examples. It's churches of Christ, the traditional churches of Christ. It's simply you you, you can you can become a Christian without ever uh, experiencing God. No conversion, no real born again experience. Often, and that's it's not preached. It was simply being baptized with water, which is why it grew very rapidly for a while. The Mormons were connected with this too. Uh, in fact, uh, Joseph Smith came in and stole a good slice of the restoration movement from from Alexander Campbell. Uh, why? Well, I suspect because Joseph Smith was charismatic. He claimed to be a prophet. He claimed to have new revelation, whereas the Campbellites were just stone cold dead. Pretty much just rationalism. Uh, Locke, John Locke, was very influential in that, which is rational Christianity which uh, scholastic Christianity, sort of, except stripped down to a New Testament only, but it's like the sacraments or the, well, communion and baptism there are just things you do. There's no knowledge of Christ. It's a system of works, and that's it. Five things you must do to be saved. See, it's something man does to be saved, not something God does, which is why the Baptists kicked them out. See, the Campbellites practiced believers' baptism, but they also had reduced Christianity to a level that God was not necessary. <laughs> it was just what you do. It was like Old Testament Judaism. Uh, no, well, actually, it wasn't. It was like rabbinic Judaism. Because in the Old Testament, you had to have faith or it didn't do any good anyway because nobody could keep the law. Anyway, the, the Lutherans under Spenner, there was a revival of personal pietism, reading the Bible for yourself. Uh, it came to sometimes it would have home Bible studies. Uh, it, it was not, so it was a personal, emphasizing a personal relationship with God that wasn't totally dependent on the church and its sacraments, which made it unpopular. But that was with the elite. With the priesthood, well, they don't call themselves priests and Lutherans, but Lutheranism, but it, it pretty much is the same thing. So what's the difference? <laughs> uh, Lutheranism is just reformed, slightly reformed Roman Catholicism, but this was a personal relationship. It was emphasizing being born, real, real, uh, the real evidence of salvation, the new birth, things that I never heard in the Lutheran Church when I grew up. Why? Because it died. Evangelical Lutheranism died. What happened to it? What's happening to evangelicalism right now in the United States is what happened to it. And it happened in the United States. This, the, uh, again, the evangelical Lutheranism was very strong in the United States, probably because they were immigrants and they came from state churches but I suspect the evangelical Lutherans were more willing to em emigrate to get out from underneath the, underneath the dead uh, Lutheran systems in their countries. Uh, state religion is always dead religion, just the nature of the beast or the, or the whore, <laughs> which is maybe more appropriate, the prostitute, uh, because the Religion, when it uh, ser when this serves the interests of the states, becomes a prostitute. It sells out to the kings of the world. Uh, Babylon the Great. That's what you, that's what Constantinianism is. The Constantinian uh, confusion, the synthesis there. The church prostituted itself to the state. <sighs> and. Uh, anyway, in the United States, it was it was the form, the, the dominant form of Lutheranism was the what's called Pietism, but that's a derogatory term nowadays by uh, the theologically inclined. I'm sure it was then too. Uh, 
And it can get out of hand. It can it can become a uh, if you're not born again, it does come back to a, uh, a system of works too. Like, I, I if I read so many chapters in the Bible a day, God will bless me. You know, some of these preachings that goes on is it come it can come back to moralism. But that's among those that aren't born again. Uh, what happened here was the evangelical Lutheranism uh, burned itself out during the Civil War. They got caught up into reforming the world. You know how one of the things, the common definitions of evangelicalism today is like uh, uh, it's it's Christ-centered, Bible-centered, cross-centered, and uh, conversion-centered, and socially, what is it, socially active as far as working in the world, trying to seeking to change the world. That's what happened there, too. Uh, that's not, all these definitions are just like descriptive. They're inv invented to try to describe a movement. They're not definitive. But uh, the, the Lutherans got tied up in the Civil War controversies, the morality of slavery and everything else, and they burned themselves out. It, it destroyed them. It just because it's it's not because it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was no power of God in there, so you're running on the power of the flesh when you enter into the sphere of politics and trying to fix the world, because God is not going to bless that. It's not his mission assignment. You're on your own. You're doing your own thing, and you burn yourself out doing it. And that's what happened, and that's when evangelical Lutheranism died. Evangelical in that sense. The uh, pietist, what they would call pietistic Lutheranism died. The personal faith, personal conversion, which is necessary for salvation, by the way. Because uh, the rituals of the Lutheran Church can no more save you than the rituals of the Roman Catholic Church. And you hear enough of those on the Internet, usually from young guys that don't know better. And I can tell they're probably not saved or they wouldn't be preaching that. They'd be de-emphasizing those things and emphasizing personal faith, genuine conversion. Do you have, do you possess uh, the... What John talks about in First John, do you love the brethren? Does Christ abide in you? Do, can you not persist in sin? Things like that. Evidence of real salvation, evidence that you have eternal life. <clears throat> but they don't, I hear these young guys and I just look at them and listen to them. Yeah, they're Lutherans, but they're probably dead. Because Jesus said, out of your, your mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So when people, there's lots of people that like to, like to talk and argue about religion. Whole denominations, whole, whole religions. But it's like the Muslims, they're, they're, uh, the average Muslim is probably more devout than most Christians, but they're dead. Their religion cannot save you. They don't have God. God is not in them. Christ is not in them. They have no atonement for their sins. Unless they come to believe in Christ, they will die in their sins. Every one of them, every person that does not trust in Christ will die in their sins because Christ is the only way to God. There is no other way. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. So they became diverted from the original awakening, from the, dead, the deadness of scholasticism and orthodox theology, dead orthodoxy. They became awakened to personal relationship with Christ. And then they got diverted by, the, by Satan into social issues like slavery and other issues having to, the, that came to a head in the Civil War. And they died. Why? Because they departed from Christ. They departed from his mission assignment to, uh, to take the gospel into all the world. 
as a witness to all nations, and instead tried to save the world apart from Christ, to fix the world. And Christians in our compassion, and I'm talking from personal experience, I am utterly guilty of this, looking at what goes on in this world. And even now with Gaza, I, I'm looking, I've got to be careful about this, lest I get caught up in things that aren't really important and forget to, to bring the gospel to bear on all this. Is when you see things in the world and you say, you can think, well, I can fix that. We, we can do that. We can, we can set up a homeless shelter or a ministry for youth or, or build a gym, uh, have like a boys club or what the YMCA was. Once. Did you know that used to be Young Men's Christian Association? <laughs> now it's just what? The Y. They left Christian out of it. They left everything out of it, come to think of it. What happened? It lost its way. It lost its way. The evangelicalism of the, the Lutherans, they lost their way. They got caught up in the affairs of the world and lost their way and died. The same thing happened in Protestantism, in the what's called the the modernist or liberal fundamentalist controversy. They got caught up in the affairs of the world, in fixing the world, in building the great society, in making the world a better place. And they died spiritually because they departed from Christ. Because Christ's agenda is he came into the world to save sinners, from their sin, from their self. He didn't come in, the, in this world to make the world that's rushing to hell more comfortable on its journey to hell. To put better seats on the Titanic, more deck chairs on the decks of the Titanic for the people's comfort while they were slowly slipping into the icy frozen waters. Death awaits all of us. Are you ready? Have, have you made peace with God? Do you have eternal life abiding in you? That's God's purpose. That's God's question, that we might be reconciled to him. Everything else is nothing compared to that. But Satan wants to divert us from that, from proclaiming the gospel, from believing the gospel, into something else. He wants us to focus, to, to dedicate our lives to something other than Christ. And I'll give you an example. of This is just a clip. I'm just using, this is a clip from James White a couple weeks ago. I just happened to look at this. I wanted to talk about this morning, this this morning anyway, and I just happened. Yeah, this would be a good example of what I'm talking about. And the title of this video is, uh, again, I think it's from two weeks ago, Jeff Durbin on Ohio and Equal Protection, uh, Mohammed Hajib's opening presentation. Actually, it's, a, it's some things that are in between these two topics. So we're going to listen to a few minutes. I want to give you a, enough of it to make some sense. And again, I'm just using him as an example uh, that, that certainly it's not limited to him. But this is where evangelicalism has gone today, all involved in the woke. It's, it doesn't matter if you're pro-woke or against woke. Wokeness, one way or the other, is fighting the wrong battle. Abortion, anti-abortion, it's fighting the wrong battle. All these socially active things are fighting the wrong battle battle. It, Satan doesn't care as long as it is not the mission Christ gave to the church. As long as we di are diverted from that and occupy ourselves with other things, Satan has won. 
he does everything he can to keep us from doing the one thing Jesus told us to do as his church. So we get caught up in the affairs of everyday life. What did Jesus say about the seed thrown, uh, sown among the, the thorny ground? It springs up, but then the, 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 uh, the concerns and activities of everyday life choke it out. Choke it out. Got to keep the garden weeded. Weeds will just choke your life out. The concerns of everyday life and the politics of this world and the things of this world will choke out the seed of, of the Word of God. And the Word of God is not the Bible. The Word of God is Christ himself. That is properly the Word of God. He is the Word of God. Scripture is Scripture. That's how it's described in the Bible. Scripture. When it says the Word of God, it's talking about Christ the living Word of God, almost always. So let's listen to this here. I hope everything works. Again, I'm not, I'm not attempting to... Uh, hmm, something... Do I have that set right? Something is... Yeah, I do. You know, there when you think about Ohio, you think about farms and rolling hills and agriculture, and you, you think about conservatives, except for, of course, the big cities. Once you get into places like Cincinnati, then everything is bright blue and, and leftist and, and uh, anti-American and everything else. But what we're seeing, uh, what we need to understand, what we need to be... Okay. Let me uh, make a little remark here. What does bright blue and these things have to do with whether or not a person is in Christ? There are as many dead, maybe as many dead, spiritually dead Republicans as Democrats. Maybe not quite as many, but <laughs> nowadays, but nevertheless... Party politics has nothing to do with Christ. That's not our focus. We, where's our kingdom? What nation are we of? Uh, yeah, I need to bring up a scripture here. Uh, this is thinking biblically, actually. And I'm sure a lot of... Uh, Evangelicals will not like what I have to say. First Peter two nine. Again, these these uh, are all taken from the law of Moses. For dispensationalists, don't realize that. <laughs> Or, yeah, because Israel is not a separate people. The church is Israel. Uh, we are the Israel of God. We are simply Israel with uh, Gentiles grafted in. But in Christ, we're one new person. We're neither Jews nor Gentiles, as Paul clearly and emphatically teaches. And if you don't want to uh, listen to Paul, then don't expect me to listen to anything you have to say. But you, plural, now Peter's apparently uh, speaking to a largely Gentile audience here, but you are a chosen generation, a generation offspring, offspring in that sense, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that, in order that, I'm sure that is that kind of a phrase, that, uh, Well, yeah, it does mean in order that. In order that, for the purpose of, you may proclaim the praises of him 
who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What does that have to do with the world. This is why God has chosen us. This is why God has called us. This is why God has saved us as his special people, in order that we may show forth his praises, proclaim his praises of the, the one who called us out of this darkness, the darkness of this world, into his light. That is why we are what we are. And if we think we belong to a different nation, some other nation, if we think we're Americans or something else, we have deceived ourselves, or rather, Satan has deceived us. Keep that in mind. Praying toward is we are seeing the results of generations of public indoctrination, not education any longer. We don't have an educational system. We have an indoctrinating, uh, indoctrinating system. True. The NEA and all of its associated unions and, act and organizations has one purpose, and that is to produce a hive mind. And what you do okay. not have any longer in the educational system, and, and since you don't have it in homes either, is moral and ethical formation. You can't, from a secular worldview, the only moral and ethical formation that can be provided is that which is mandated by the state. Okay, I've got to stop and comment on this. Moral and ethical formation saves no one. In fact, it will deceive you. Because you will think that you can stand in your own moral and ethic, ethnic, ethic, ethical formation. You don't need the righteousness of Christ because you're not a sinner like they are. It is deceitful. And until God convinces you of how bad a sinner you really are, that you are indeed, that he convinces you, are you that you indeed are, are worthy of being cast into hell, you will not turn to the Savior because you don't think you need him. You are a good person because you've been morally and ethically formed. This is, this is serving Satan. This, the very idea that this contributes to salvation Unless you're not concerned with salvation at all, unless your concern is not the purpose of God's kingdom, but the purpose of the kingdoms of this world where you happen to reside in particular. Because if this nation continues on its path, it will be more and more uncomfortable for us, won't it? Now, people that complain about dispensationalism and their their escape program of a pre-tribulational secret rapture. But yet, they, why, they criticize that. Well, they just want to escape difficulties. But others, they want to fix the country so they can escape difficulties, and their family will escape difficulties. So they don't want to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. So let we make this country Christian, and it'll be safe for us. Is that God's purpose? Or did he say, go into all the world? What happened to, the, to all of the apostles? They were all martyred. John was martyred too. He just didn't die from the torment. He became. Martyr means witness. Yes, they, according to church tradition, they tried to boil him in oil. He just didn't die. So they exiled him to Patmos. Anyway, 
what is Christ's purpose? We should be focused on that, not on this world. See, the world, they are the weeds and the thorns that suck the life out of the seed of God, out of that which springs forth from the Word of God. They suck the life out of it. They, they, they take the, the moisture that's necessary and the nutrients that are necessary in the soil, and they suck it away so it doesn't bear fruit. The God of the system. And so when you talk to the younger generation today, this is what you hear. You don't, you don't hear any kind of formed morality or ethical system. They think moral and ethics, morality and ethics, is what you feel. Morality and ethics requires you to have a foundation, we use the term worldview today, but a foundation and a set of principles to make application, not only to yourself, but to others. The secular worldview, all you have is yourself, your emotions, your feelings. There isn't any objective truth. There is no foundation that's going to be relevant to other people. There can't be anything. All right. Let me point out something. I think this is as far as I'll go in this. You can have moral and ethical foundations without Jesus Christ. As a Lutheran, we had to memorize in confirmation the Ten Commandments, part of, part of the uh, Luther's small catechism. We had to memorize the whole small catechism which can consider like the Ten Commandments and Luther's amplification of the Ten Commandments, uh, which was rather repetitive, if I recall. That did nothing to save me. There was nothing that I learned from memorizing that book. Because in that book, there is no gospel. Luther neglected to put the gospel because he didn't think it was necessary because we're saved by water baptism. We were sprinkled. Therefore, it was assumed we're regenerate Christians. But my life testified to me that I was a stranger to God. And eventually it reached a point where I could not even pretend to be a Christian. Well, that involved the Holy Spirit beginning to open my eyes to my own reality, too. And when he does his work in you, eventually you'll come to the point where you, you will recognize that you would be justly cast into hell. And you would have to say amen because you know yourself, yourself that you deserve it. And that's when you begin to seek a Savior. Well, didn't I hear something about Jesus and saving and a cross? And then the Holy Spirit proclaimed the gospel to me. I did not receive it from men, but from God. That he died for my sins, Christ died for my sins, all my sins, past, present, and future. And in him, I have salvation. I have eternal life. I have reconciliation to God. Amazing thing. God forbid that, uh, forbid that I forget that. And God forgive me for those times that I've... that slipped from my mind. I don't live in the light of that. Got caught up in other things that aren't important. They're not important. It's not doesn't say that sometimes we need a break, but you know you can only our bodies are weak. <laughs> they don't take to stress too well. So over here with with James White. So so what is moral? You're trying to save America in a way that will not save people. 
you can't save countries. Of course, he's into theonomy and Christian nationalism and all this other stuff. It won't save a single person because it doesn't involve Christ. Moral formation does not require Christ. Jesus isn't interested in moral formation. He's interested in regeneration. Only God can do that. Man can teach morals. God is the only one that can actually save you because the work is supernatural. Genuine Christianity is always supernatural. So all this tinkering, trying to save America, trying to have a Christian nation, trying to pass laws, trying to oppose this thing and support that thing, it is all a distraction from the mission that Jesus Christ gave us, because only the gospel saves, only faith in Christ saves. What good would it have be to have a moral nation, a nation that lived with law and order, a nation with no illegal immigration, no poverty, no nothing, but no Christ. What would it good uh, good would it be to live in paradise, yet be not reconciled to God in Christ? What good would it do you? Where we've gone right now is simply back to the beginning. The United States is simply Rome, pagan Rome. Again, it is this Rome 2.0, as everybody began to talk about back in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union, or the, the self-dismantlement of the Soviet Union, more likely. Now, the United States didn't overcome it. It just fell from within. It could no longer hold itself together. The United States, I remember, that we, are, we are now the world superpower, we, the, the, the hegemon of the world. We are the new Rome. They were using that language, the new Rome, the Roman Empire. We control the entire world. Nobody's a match for us. So then they rapidly slid into the, the pagan Roman model, too. What good does it do? So, but... The, the early church was born into that. It was born into the pagan Roman Empire in the midst of a hostile Jewish community. We were born into enmity with the world, enmity with the governments, enmity with Satan, born by God into this. Just as Jesus Christ was born into a feed trough in a stable, born there, laid in a manger, a feed trough for animals. Not into the ideal circumstances. There was no place for him in this world. No place in the inn. We want the best inn. Are we unwilling to follow Christ? Are we unwilling to take up a cross and follow him in the midst of a hostile world? You don't take up a cross if there is no hostility toward you. It is unnecessary. Is it not? What did the early church do? Did they go out and try to solve homelessness, try to solve the problems of abortion? There was abortion. Certainly. Did they try to solve the problems of infanticide? Did they try to solve the problems of slavery? Did they try to solve the problems with Roman entertainment in the Colosseums and the gladiator matches and the public execution of criminals and all the blood sports of Rome? Did they try to solve the problems of the imperial government and their, their uh, 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 what did they do, um, uh, adulterating the currency and everything else? Did they care about that stuff? No. They didn't involve themselves. In it. They certainly were aware of it, but they didn't focus on it. What, which one of the disciples, which one of the apostles, what, did Jesus Christ himself concern himself 
with those things in this world? Or did he set his face like flint to go to that cross to accomplish his mission, which was to die for the sins of the world? And what is our task to proclaim to the world that Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, and that all can receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, through faith in him? As a gift, not of works, but as the gift from God through faith. What's our mission? To fix the world or to save sinners out of this world into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To be in Christ, to be in the new covenant, is to be in his kingdom. What's our mission? Is a servant supposed to be entangled in affairs other than the affairs of his Lord and Master? No. What is a child of God supposed to be concerned with? The kingdom that he's heir to? Or the kingdoms that are going to be destroyed when Christ returns? It's not that difficult a question. The problem lies in our heart and the fact that our flesh loves this world. But Christians... We have to cling to Christ and not cling to the things of this world because this world and Christ are not going in the same directions. 